All right, hi, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Scott Frank at Bow and Arrow. Uh, it's July 17th, 2019. Thanks so much for joining us today, Scott. We appreciate my pleasure. this. My pleasure. So we'll start you out by asking, uh, why wine? Why wine? Um, all right. Um, I came into wine quite by accident. Um, probably the two most important things that have happened to me uh, in my life as an adult was 9-11 and then wine. Everything good that's happened to my, in my life in the last 17, 18 years happened as a result of those two things. <laughs> so this, this might sound really morbid, but 9-11 was the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, I experienced it firsthand. I was living in New York City and uh, that was a traumatic experience, you could say. And so uh, I decided to move to Portland for an indeterminate amount of time and um, <clears throat> ended up staying and met somebody and I moved in with a girl and um, blew through my savings and turns out that live-in unemployed boyfriend is kind of one of the least sexy things <laughs> in the universe. Uh, so, uh, out of uh, you know, uh, care and concern for me, she sent me a, a classified ad for a w assistant wine steward position at New Seasons. This is back in 2003, so I'd never heard of New Seasons. They only had three stores at that time. And um, as we already covered, I didn't have enough money to, to shop at fancy grocery stores. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, post-college, post-professional you know, life in New York, I drug myself to what you know, I felt was an uh, embarrassing you know, career path uh, in, a, in a grocery store. Um, and completely bluffed my way through the interview. I did not know anything about wine, uh, really, but got offered the job. <sighs> Tried to decline it <laughs> because I didn't want to work in a grocery store. I now know there's nothing wrong with working in a grocery store. That's also one of the best things that happened to me. But at the time, I thought that was just, that was not the path that I had seen for myself. Um, and Charlie Keeley, the, 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 the wine steward at that New Seasons store at the time, uh, when he called off me the job and I tried to turn it down, uh, said to me, Scott, I don't know you that well, but um, I think you might need this. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you just give it a try? You can always quit. Uh, and so, um, so I took the job and um, I very quickly discovered that wine has a, um, I guess, an architecture to it that aligns perfectly with the way that the architecture of music works in my mind. And for a large part of my life, music was the thing that helped me organize the world. It, it helped me figure out was what was good and what was true and what was beautiful, kind of the classics. Mm -hmm. um, and also to find my people. You know, I could look in, in junior high, I could look over at that kid's notebook and see that he had, you know, written U2 or The Clash or some shit on his notebook. And I knew I maybe had found one of my people and I could be friends with them. I grew up in a small town always felt a little marginal mm -hmm. uh, and not mainstream um, you know from an early age and um, w what I found is that you could use wine to as a way to organize the world as well into what is good and true mm -hmm. and beautiful and also find your people if someone was drinking some Clos Roche Blanche or came into the store and wanted to drink some Pinot d'Anise, I had an, in, there was an instant connection with them on a human level because that's the same shit I was really interested in. And so really quickly, it occurred to me that wine could play this role in your life mm -hmm. uh, that music did for me. And so I had a in pretty instant affinity for it once I started studying it and tasting it and talking about it on a daily basis. And um, 
from there I got pro I got promoted to open up a, a new store and be the head steward so that I could make all the buying decisions myself and kind of shape the, the department and hire staff and train and mentor people in wine. Um, and uh, I think retail has always shaped the way that I see wine. It's a very, um, I guess I should be more specific. By starting my career working in the wine department of a grocery store, I tend to view wine as a grocery, mm -hmm. uh, as an everyday commodity or an everyday food. And <clears throat> that's probably also shaped by my, uh, just my upbringing in a kind of small, rural, upstate New York town. Um, relatively poor, you know, <laughs> you know, government co-op food and, and stints and trailer parks and things like that. Um, I think those th two things combined to give me a, uh, what you see here is a very utilitarian and kind of working class, for lack of a better word, posture towards wine. There's no, um, there's no tasting room here. There's no monogram fleece vests or uh, wine keys that I'm trying to sell you. It's just, this is a workplace, you know, come here nine to five, Monday through Friday, go home, take a shower and live the rest of my life. Um, <clears throat> but I'm digressing. <laughs> um, we're talking about why I got into, how I got into wine. So then, uh, as a, as a result of buying an unconscionable amount of wine from Cameron, from John Paul at Cameron, um, I, I went and worked Harvest uh, in 2005 and 2006, Cameron. Mm -hmm. And the summer after that 06 vintage, I guess it would have been summer of 07, he and Tyson uh, Crowley, who was the assistant at the time, invited me out for lunch at the winery and told me that Tyson was moving on to start his label, or he, he had started, but he was moving mm -hmm. on to do it full time or part time. And um, they offered me the job as assistant winemaker. And at Cameron, that's a, that's a, bit, it's a bigger uh, position than it sounds. Uh, from what I can gather, most wineries, the assistant winemaker position is ex almost exclusively a seller position. But at Cameron, they're one of the few uh, wineries in Oregon where um, they farm the domain themselves. Mm -hmm. So John is the, doing the farming and the winemaking, therefore the assistant's doing the farming and the winemaking. Both things in which I had no experience and really no qualifications. I didn't have an academic background or an experiential background that would lend itself to thinking that someone should offer me that position. So I tried to turn it down. <laughs> <laughs> you got dragged into wine cooking and screaming. I did, man. And Tyson pulled me aside and was like, what are you doing, dude? Like, just take the job. Basically, a similar um, you know, version of Charlie telling me, hey, dude, I don't know you that well, but I think you need this. This was another one of those moments where, um, in spite of you know, what I expected, uh, I, I was offered an opportunity that I did not merit, at least on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, so, we start to creep into metaphysical explanations for why I'm in wine, and I get kind of uncomfortable with that. I went to Evergreen, so I developed a little bit of an allergy to metaphysical shit. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't come up with any other better explanation. It doesn't make sense. So, um, you know, I, I, I spent four vintages as the assistant at Cameron, and um, during the last vintage started Bow and Arrow. And, um, yeah, I kind of got into wine by accident and as a result of fleeing Manhattan after living through 9-11. So that's, that's my genesis story, I guess, in wine. Sure. Yeah. So let's back up a second to you buffing your way into this steward job at New yeah. Seasons and, without really any knowledge of wine. So tell me about that learning process of learning, tasting, talking about wine every day and how long it took you to sort of feel the knowledge and the, and the kind of pull. Well, fortunately for me, Charlie had a, a similar attitude about, about wine slash life as I did. And um, it's much more um, kind of 
democratic and capitalistic than academic. Um, you know, someone's coming into the store and they're making chicken and they've got $12 to spend. What is the, what should I drink? What should I buy? And um, um, I, I think I just developed a, a real uh, kinship with Charlie's attitude about wine, that it was just regular shit for regular people and there was no reason to talk down or to lord knowledge or taste over anyone. It was a way to just connect with people, mm -hmm. to be helpful, to um, talk about stuff that you had mutual, mutual interest in. And um, so again, I keep, I'll probably overuse this word utilitarian, but it was it, the, the lens that I learned about wine through was just how can wine be helpful to people? <laughs> and be delicious or cool. Um, I've never been a, su a big fan of kind of the super academic uh, approach to thinking about wine. It's more like a rock and roll or art from our perspective. Is it cool or not? Like, I think cool doesn't get enough currency. <laughs> Is this wine cool? How did you find with uh as you're trying to, you're talking about kind of building cool with, yeah. with, with, with customers, how did they respond to that? How did that kind of build uh, your, your knowledge and your, and your, I guess, your palate? Um, because we managed, Charlie and I, you know, it, it mainly for, you know, taking a cue from him, to turn that aisle of a, of a grocery store into um, shop culture. Um, Shop culture is something that I really love, and um, it's just a really American, democratic, capitalist little subculture where you find things that you have, um, you share a desire uh, for. What, oh God, I'm, I am going to get academic. What David Hickey called a community of desire, that if you go to that surfboard shop, even if you buy the surfboard in the first five minutes, that guy that owns that shop is going to probably follow you out of the store chewing your ear off about surfboards because he just wants to talk about surfboards <laughs> with other people who are into surfboards. And you find that in record stores and in bookshops and, you know, art galleries. Um, these are places that are just kind of ostensibly about commerce but they're really spaces for people to have, to, to share in mutual desires. Um, I didn't realize I was gonna like work out my thesis while we did this. this is, yeah. It was good, <laughs> it's good thing we're recording this so you can go back and watch it I need the, I'm gonna need the transcript, okay? <laughs> sure, so pause real quick. Yeah. So we talk about this kind of community of culture, yeah. shop, shop culture. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's how it felt. Like we had a band of regulars that would come through and sometimes buy wine from us, sometimes just come to hang out for sometimes 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour on the aisle of a grocery store to talk about wine sometimes, but then other times just to talk about whatever. Um, talk about food, talk about politics, talk about music, talk about you know anything. It was, um, it was a very formative, uh, time and uh, and it was just cool like mm -hmm. there's not many you don't you don't often have opportunities in life to um, to get a job that you look forward to going that you'd race to get to that you really look forward to going to and it helped that at that time New Seasons was owned privately by a couple like three families and they just had a kind of radical take on on what a grocery store should do, what it should be, the kind of the structure of the business. And I didn't know it at the time, but I was getting essentially a, a master class in, in business. You know, mm -hmm. that was my master's in business. I was working at New Seasons for four years. Uh, a lot of the things I learned from that original iteration of New Seasons infuses you know, a lot of the work mm -hmm. that, that I do here and how we run our business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, uh, they were groundbreaking in, 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 in some ways um, for, 
for instance, you know, it's unheard of in grocery or the restaurant service industry to have a regular schedule that's the same every week so that you can actually plan your life like a regular human being. Um, that doesn't sound that radical, but no one would, no one did that, you know. Um, and to this day, you know, if you work in those industries, maybe you learn Sunday night what your schedule is that week, and that's just completely disrespectful to the people working there. Um, and things like that just had an impact on me that the quality of life for the people that work in your business should be as important, if not more important, than ostensibly what it is you do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But getting into some, like, what about Socialist the socialist labor shit here all of a sudden. <laughs> it's a good thing you said it's a good thing you mentioned with Evergreen. That really like that kinda like sets up all the rest of this. It makes, yeah, it makes right, a lot of sense. Right. I, I mean it kinda it's weird how things in your life that at the time you can't see how they're gonna serve you or how they're gonna help you in seemingly unrelated ways in the future they're they, they do. Like my experience at Evergreen is the mo one of the most important things that I experienced in order to have to you know rather than um, in navigating this really complex multifaceted world of, of a winery there's mm -hmm. so many things you have to be adept at or fake until you are <laughs> 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 and that was the greatest lesson I learned at Evergreen <laughs> act as if you know until you know <laughs> Look how far it's gotten you. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about the wine itself and, and, yeah. and building uh, to the point where you felt comfortable recommending wine to people and telling them if they had, you know, what's the best way to spend their $12? I acted like I knew until I knew. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's an impossible task. You know, the, it's, a, it's a wall of hundreds of wines that you can't possibly drink, you know, and, uh, and, and understand. And so, uh, you know, a lot of it's just being resourceful and picking things like over, you know, overhearing uh, my boss talk about wine or um, uh, using the tasting note on the shelf, the shelf talker as a crib sheet, <laughs> <laughs> but faking it until you make it. You know, uh, you didn't, you never wanted to lie. Um, but what I've learned in wine is that most people, whether they're at a, a shop or a store trying to buy a bottle of wine or at a restaurant ordering a bottle of wine, and particularly in a restaurant because it's probably the most expensive thing that they're going to purchase at that meal like many times over, is that I think above all else they just want to know that it's going to be okay. <laughs> Not a text sheet on the wine mm -hmm. or a biography of the producer. What they really want to know is it's going to be okay. So I think the real job uh, was letting people know that it was going to be okay. And New Seasons afforded us this wonderful luxury of making like promises that they would keep. So I could say to somebody, you know what? If you don't like this, you can bring it back and we'll give you your money back or replace it with something else that you might like. Um, that was another one of the radical things that, mm -hmm. that they did, that there was a blanket policy to stand behind the employee's promises or decisions to a customer, whatever it was, and stand behind it mm -hmm. and let them make make those offers make those claims and promises it's cool <clears throat> so tell me about john paul why do you think he offered you the job that that makes me uncomfortable to think about why he might have done <laughs> Three years of therapy, I'm still not comfortable talking intimately and vulnerably about myself. <laughs> <laughs> Getting there though. Um, shit, why do you, I think he hired me. Okay, if I'm just, if I'm honest, I think because now that I, now that I have a winery and I've done many vintages, um, the things that I value in the people that work for me is, are not, um, specifically related to their experience in wine. That's helpful, that's icing on the cake, but really I want a smart person, a hardworking person with some aspiration or ambition, and someone with a sense of humor that makes me laugh and can fill the countless hours that you spend together with interesting conversation. <clears throat> I 
think I met those qualifications for <laughs> John. And he wasn't particularly interested in what I knew about winemaking or farming. Um, and now that I do what he does, I can see that um, qualifications are overrated. Like I'd much rather hire a good person and teach him something. Because if I can take a good person to teach him something, that's not very flattering uh, depiction of me. So <clears throat> I think it's much harder to find those people. There is a sea of people out there that know how to work a harness mm -hmm. or come in and top barrels and clean shit. <clears throat> There's far fewer people that I want to spend 40 hours a week with. <laughs> I, I think that's it. I think that's really it. Yeah. I can see that. So tell me about the experiences at Cameron and, and learning both vineyard and cellar kind of simultaneously. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, yeah. what, and what about that made you want to do this? What about that made me want to do this? Well, first of all, I mean, it was intense. It was the hardest thing uh, career-wise or work-wise that I had ever experienced. It's, that is really demanding. Um, and I know people around the world do it. It's not common here though, but farming is hard ass work. Mm -hmm. Like the hardest work. The cellar work, not so hard. But farming is hard, grueling work and a lot of times very lonely and, you know, and isolating. So you have to have a certain discipline or mental posture to get through that. And it was really challenging. Um, I didn't do too well at first and uh, later John, you know, I think at my first review at the year mark, told me he didn't think I was going to make it. Um, I mean, I was standing around in a grocery store aisle. I wasn't in great shape, you know, we worked hard there tossing beer in cases of wine, but it was nothing like working in a cellar or working in a vineyard. <clears throat> and it just took a long time to train yourself to, to do that work. Um, and I, I, I had just come from a job that was incredibly social and I was talking to people all the time and that's kind of my currency, mm -hmm. spending a lot of time alone <laughs> doing repetitive tasks, not my strong suit. And so it, that presented a lot of challenges. Um, it was a real, um, test of, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, for me to to find if I could adapt and grow and evolve into work at this point in my life. I mean, I was in my mid-30s by this point. So, um, yeah, it was personally really challenging. Um, what came from that uh, experience, uh, because when you're working alone in the vineyard, you got a lot of time to think. <laughs> And I was like, all right, you know, between the work and the commute, I'm spending, you know, 50, 55 hours, sometimes 60 hours working really hard for some other dude's thing. Um, damn, if I can't make a go of my thing working that many hours a week, I probably don't deserve to have a thing. So I either need to accept this current situation or I need to make a go of it. And, um, so the, the desire to, to, to leave and start my own thing preceded um, my thoughts about how that would look, what kind of um, winery would it be. And that was shaped in large part by my experience at New Seasons, having a much more um, kind of working class relationship with, with wine. Um, I didn't cut my teeth on Burgundy. I, I couldn't afford it. <laughs> that's, not who my, that's not what my friends or even my colleagues were drinking. Couldn't afford Bordeaux, couldn't afford Champagne, couldn't drink Barolo. Um, and so if you were gonna drink good wine, you had to ascertain which regions had the best wines for the money, the, uh, the best wines that you could afford. And quickly the Loire emerged as kind of the most reliable place where you could drink a wide spectrum of styles and varieties. And on a grocery store salary, I could drink the best Muscadet. The best, every day of the week. 
I could drink the best wine from Turin. I could drink the best Manitou Salon. I could drink the best Janier. I could, I mean, literally, I could drink the top producer from an AOC on a grocery store wage. So that's what I ended up drinking most of the time was Loire wine. And um, that just seemed to really resonate with, with me when it came time to, to thinking about what I wanted to do with, with, with bow and arrow. Um, so on multiple levels, um, I felt it was a bit disingenuous to, to make wines and use a region as a template that I had no real experience uh, with or any connection for that matter. Um, I probably also am innately uh, inclined um, to do the opposite of what, of what the majority, what everyone else is doing. Um, for better or worse, it's, that's not a fun or easy road to, to hoe, but I can't help it. So just on a molecular level, I was like, I don't want to make Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and Pinot Gris. It just did not sound fun to me. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with those varieties. <laughs> I love those wines, but that's not, I didn't have anything to say. And I'm like, who wants to, be? you know, I didn't want to be a little voice in a big chorus of Pinot Noir, right? Um, and so because I knew the Loire and I knew how those wines should taste and I have a kind of a biting philosophy that knowing what good wine or good version of that grape or style should taste like is more useful to you as a winemaker than an education at a school that trains you to make wine. Um, I've seen, and I've seen this bear out with, with, with people who make wine that have no skill set of training whatsoever, make really compelling, delicious wine, and people with all the training in the world make really unremarkable, not delicious stuff. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but that's all kind of anecdotal, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so A, that was the wine region that I've had the, uh, the most experience and love for, and I felt was in my, my, the marrow of my bones. And so it felt right to make that. Also, the history of the Loire being um, wine that historically uh, supplied the bistros of Paris with just their everyday wine. It wasn't an aristocratic pursuit. Yeah, there's a bunch of chateaus in the Loire. Yes, some rich people made wine, but for the most part, the Loire is not where chateaus and domains and grand estates and they weren't making wine for the Pope and they weren't making wine for the King. They were making wine for people and the wines are priced in a way that reflects that. And that felt really true to me and, and authentic to me. Um, and the reason that felt like a good business decision is because if you go back to 2007, eight, nine, when I was working in that, you know, in, in, you know, in the market, um, there was a lot of hand-wringing about why restaurants in Portland were not supporting Willamette Valley wine. Mm -hmm. And a lot of complaining and people you know wondering why they weren't getting support but in the defense of, of a wine buyer or sommelier at a restaurant in portland there's only so many wines that are going to be 120 150 dollars on the wine list that all kind of have a monolithic profile and taste the same that you can put on there you, you know it makes no sense to have 15 wines that are all that price point and kind of taste the same um, it was a failure in the region to supply its own market with variety and more importantly wine that was affordable for everyday folk. And so that's why if I felt like if I could find the fruit or get people to graft it or plant it, that the price point and the ability for a wine director to go, oh God, get what, not Pinot? I could, whoa. Uh, not Pinot Gris? Yes, I'll put that on the list. And that proved to be true. You know, I'm sure, I don't know if you've talked to people like Barnaby and Olga. Like, they found the same thing. You know, we started around the same time. I think they started one year before I did. And they were like my canary or my test case. I was like, damn, if they can get people on board doing Alsatian and German wines, <laughs> I think I can do this with Loire wine or wine influenced by the Loire. And so, um, yeah, I think, the, I, mean, I think the last pillar then of it was uh, um, 
taking John's philosophy of farming, you know, uh, organically or, you know, decidedly on that end of the farming uh, spectrum. Um, and his work with, you know, giving up yeasting most of the wines and using native yeasts and just using a really uh, non-interventionist, low input, like, there's a whole heap of con um, con uh, controversy causing words for the kind of wine we make. <laughs> what I'm circumlocuting, what would eventually become what we call natural wine. Um, those, I think th those were the things that shaped Bo you know, w w shaped Bone Arrow, mm -hmm. was wanting to make wines in that manner, reference a different region that, that I felt was more true to me and my friends and what we drank. Um, yeah. I think that's kind of the blueprint for Bone Arrow. Okay. Yeah. So once you decided to get started, how did you choose the space? How did you choose Portland? How did you choose this particular area to get going? Um, again, <laughs> I learned from John. You know, he's always self-distributed. He lives in Portland. He doesn't live in the Valley. And I, I received another master class in branding and marketing. Um, there are other ways to brand and market something successfully. But I really love the approach of using personal connections and relationships to market and brand yourself. That just seems more durable and real and fun, <laughs> honestly. Um, and it doesn't cost any money. I don't have to spend any money to get in my car. Well, maybe I gotta spend some gas, but to go and actually talk to the person buying the wine. Um, more importantly, that dude has been delivering the wine for almost 30 years. A lot of people in the business view it as a sign of success that they no longer have to wheel a hand truck in the back door of a grocery store. He never saw it that way. Um, and I think that that was an invaluable lesson that um, sense of humility <laughs> or, uh, towards this whole thing mm -hmm. you know that you're you know you're, we're not a, we're not prince and princesses we're just we're just making we're making something that yes can be beautiful and transcendent and like uh, emotional and, and cool but we, we are making food <laughs> and other people who make food wheel a hand truck in the back door of a grocery store <laughs> um, and so I, I, saw, I saw the benefits in living in your chief market mm -hmm. rather than occasionally driving up and trying to touch people in, in one day. Um, this is where I lived. This is where all my customers were. Uh, this is where all the people I knew were. And after spending, um, you know, uh, essentially an entire work week a month in a car commuting. Uh, that just seemed like a, a, not a very good use of my time. And so living here and creating the winery here, which that's not how I started. I, for the first couple of vintages, the wine, I was using space down in McMinnville and I was making that commute. And then um, eventually did a vintage at the collective. So that was the first vintage that I was able to do in town. And then in 13, we got this space. Uh, so from the beginning, the goal was to to make wine here in town, mm -hmm. which I don't want to be precious about this, but I don't love the term urban winery because it's just a winery and we didn't invent this. It's not a trend. It's not a fad. When you get out of the aristocratic winemaking regions, what you often find is, is that the, the winery is in the town maybe underneath the house or in the village and the vineyards around the country and they're, and they're separate. They're not one and the same. That model is a model that we adopted in the United States based on just a couple regions uh, in Europe. That's not normative. What's far more common is just a workspace in the town. <laughs> you make the wine and then you get in the car and you go out to the vineyard and work in it and then you come back to work. And so, um, you know, I don't take that much umbrage, but I, what I don't like is that the word urban winery comes with some baggage that you're not a real winery or it's, um, 
it's you're just doing something trendy or um, you can't make as good wine in a place that's not in the right zip code. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> There's nothing functionally different between a pole barn in Salem and this underground space in Portland mm -hmm. at all, unless you're trying to book events. <laughs> 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 then a view comes in handy. But other than that, there's not that much, there's, uh, there's no difference. You know, I made wine in a lot of places. There's no difference between the valley and the city. So tell me about, you've made the decision to do Loire Valley grapes. Yeah. So tell me about finding people who uh, want to grow grapes for you, building those relationships, figuring out yeah. kind of what varietals you want to work yeah. with, et cetera. Yeah, that was difficult at first. There was some laughter and some derision. <laughs> Uh, I was told uh, on many occasions that certain grapes wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get them ripe here. Um, ripeness is just a state of mind. It's not a, <laughs> it's not a thing. <laughs> um, I joke, but that's true. I think ripeness is a, is a relative term, and it's relative to what your conception of, 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 the, of the wine you're trying to make happens to be. It's not a fixed point that, oh, this is ripe. You could make a case that for a long time people were calling ripe a fruit that was physiologically decaying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cell walls are breaking down. That's not life, that's death. Mm -hmm. And so there was a good run there where people were picking fruit when it was actually decaying, dying. Um, I think we're trending away from that now. So that, I think that's a positive. Um, what are we talking about? How you found people to grow grapes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, 2010, 11, there was, there was a sentiment that these wouldn't be economically viable. They wouldn't be, uh, they wouldn't even be possible to ripen. Um, eventually I found, because I started off with Pinot, ironically, Pinot was the first wine we made. Pinot does grow in the Loire, we know this, but it's not necessarily what it's known for, but it's present, um, so I felt okay with it. But um, I found Johan, and I think I found a young vineyard owner and a young vineyard manager that were more sympathetic to my argument of diversifying your crop. That's probably just good business sense. Uh, I think I'm finding people way more receptive, growers way more receptive to that conversation than they were 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. That it's in your interest to, um, to grow a diverse, uh, diverse crops because you have some resiliency against you know, gluts in the market or um, changes in supply and demand. Um, but they, at that time, had a lot of Pinot Noir that was not considered sexy because it was quote unquote a cool site and you couldn't get it ripe. Um, and so I think they were having some difficulty selling all the fruit. And they were on board for experimenting with grafting some acreage over to things that I really desired to work with. Uh, so initially that was Milan and Gamay and Cabernet Franc. It's been wildly successful. If you talk to them, they will tell you their most profitable block in the whole vineyard is the Milan. Even though the price per ton is less than Pinot, the yields are much higher and it actually tastes better at those higher yields <laughs> than it does if you crop it like you do uh, Pinot Noir, or Pinot Gris, or Chardonnay. Um, the Cabernet Franc could not be easier to grow. Pinot Noir and Gamay are fussy grapes to grow. Cabernet Franc is effortless seemingly. It's bulletproof, it's disease resistance, it just hangs in there and like. It's bulletproof, seemingly. Um, so there was a lot of these um, narratives or this conventional thinking that in, in reality did not turn out to be true. Um, and so slowly people have got, become more receptive, yeah, especially after they've seen the demand for Gamay go through the roof and everybody's scrambling to plant Gamay. And there are, I've been offered Gamay at prices that are almost twice as much as the highest price I've ever paid for Pinot Noir. That's insane. That's just nuts. That's just ridiculous. That's not 
what Gamay is. It's not the role <laughs> Gamay plays in the world. It's not prestige wine. It's not cellar wine. It can be, but that's not what it, that's not the role it plays in the regions that it historically comes from. Um, and so, yeah, and initially it was quite difficult. I had to scramble. I had to find parts of the valley that um, I had been trained to think were inferior. That I mean, the, the victors write history, right? So the narrative that I grew up in the wine industry under was that the good soil, the good wines were made in the Hollywood Hills of the Willamette Valley and the, and the <laughs> names, the AVAs. Not knocking them, you can make good wine there. What was inaccurate was the corollary that therefore you could not make good wine around Eugene or Corvallis or on the East Valley. Now, I think most of us have tasted enough really freaking delicious wine from those places to know that that's just not true. Um, sedimentary soil is not, by definition, a garbage terroir. And by the way, <laughs> there's not very many premier wine growing regions on earth that I'm aware of that champion clay as an asset. But, the, but we're often told that we're the other Grand Cru Burgundy, you know, terroir in the world. It's deep, wet, homogenous clay, come on. <laughs> a lot of the wineries that I've been to rank the cost and the prestige of their bottlings when, according to soil, and, and the one that's in the clay is almost always at, ranked at the bottom and is the cheapest. So um, that kind of narrative that that this is the good part of the valley and then the rest is the inferior bad turned out to be untrue and i found that's where i found initially like much more willing you know partners or growers uh the fruit was cheaper to me it was just as good um and some of those people have now grafted uh shenna for me or she, sorry i can't believe i pronounced it with a french accent that i want stricken from the right <laughs> <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> shenin block um Thank you. <laughs> That's the only thing that I'm going to be embarrassed about in this whole talk is pronouncing Chenin Blanc Chenin. <laughs> I would punch me. <laughs> oh my God. Why is it, why is it um, pretentious to pronounce a croissant, a croissant, but anyone who called it pano chocolate would look like an idiot? Like you've got, it, it doesn't make any sense, right? You got to say pan chocolate. You can't call it a pan de chocolate. Anyway, um, so getting French lessons here today. Dude. This, this, is in, this is just all over the place. I love this. <laughs> Wide ranging. <laughs> we cover a lot of ground. Um, so now, now, like this weekend, I'm going out to talk to uh, a landowner that wants to plant a vineyard, and they want me to come out so they can plant whatever it is I like, like that's a lot of ground to cover in 10 years. Hmm. Like I didn't, I didn't, yeah, I didn't think that day would come 10 years ago. Literally they're like, we're going to plant a new vineyard. We're going to farm it organically, biodynamically, in some kind of regenerative conscientious way. And we'll plant whatever you want. I think that's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, that is, that's crazy. Um, so yeah, we'll put in a nice potluck of, you know, Loire varieties and maybe some other interesting things. Um, I think we got to eventually talk about hybrids, but that's another discussion for another time. <laughs> so tell me about that growth though, from, you talk about sort of 10 years from, uh, nobody wants to make grape, grow your grapes, yeah. to uh, now they want to grow grapes specifically for yeah. you. Talking about growing bow and arrow, and, and you talk about the kind of personal branding and the, the how have you gotten here? I'm fixing to just be wildly speculative. I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm not being evasive or trying to be, um, have any false humility, but I really think it's timing. I think. I think it was just in the air. And I'm gonna, I don't know who said this. It's a quote I like though, but it's, it, the quote is, it's steam engines when it's steam engine time. Mm -hmm. Emergent 
technology discoveries, developments, trends, they just happen when the, the environment is right for that thing to happen. And I really think that an alternative um, branch of the Willamette Valley story um, was, um, was fomenting, you know, in, 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 and I don't understand all the forces that led to that, but some of them, you know, we've touched on. I, I think that Willamette Valley wine was getting really monolithic, you know, in the, in the 90s and through the early 2000s. Certainly Oregon Pinot and Pinot Gris was starting to get monolithic. It, it had a very similar profile, similar taste, similar architecture to the wines. The prices were creeping up. Um, and I think there was just a natural backlash to that. Mm. You know, Arena Rock was not going to be popular forever. Like, it peaked. And whenever something peaks, there's always going to be uh, a reaction or a rebellion to that. That's why we got punk rock, right? Because Led Zeppelin just got too dang big. Um, and I think Pinot Noir got too dang big. And there, the, there was just a natural rebellion, a youthful response to that, which is, I, I don't want to be my dad <laughs> or my mom. Um, I think that's just the nature of things, you know. Um, other wine regions in the world, you know, enact a whole array of laws to try to prevent that from happening. But whenever you go there, you can feel, you know, the younger generation trying in whatever way they can to push back against the constraints of tradition and the laws surrounding, you know, their AOC or their DOC or their DOP. Um, tradition is a, is, is a double-edged sword. It can, it can protect quality and heritage and honor the past and your ancestors, but it can also be constraining and, and um, be um, an obstacle to evolution, you know? Um, again, I think I'm losing my way. What were we talking about? <laughs> well, I think you just called yourself like the Nirvana of wine. <laughs> Yeah, I get it now. I get it now. Yeah, you asked about like you know why that happened, um, or why Bone Arrow was able to, I guess, it, um, you know, have the modest success we do. Let's let's be honest. Like we have never made more than four thousand cases. That's a different measure of success than making you know being a successful fifty thousand case winery or a hundred thousand case winery. I'm well aware that the hurdles and challenges involved in making a successful brand that's this small is, is totally different than selling a lot of wine. Um, but those things that you have to do to sell a lot of wine, they're just not things that I'm particularly interested in doing. Um, so I, yeah, so the timing. I think a lot of it had to do with timing. I think if we did this in 2002, the outcome would likely have been very different. Um, you know, I'm just an example of, of what was percolating at that time, you know. The, the, um, the historical benchmark wines had become out of reach and too expensive for people breaking into the wine business in, what, in whatever arena. It became too expensive for them to drink, so it couldn't form their opinion and their palate. So other regions had to inform people's opinions about wines for better or worse, I think almost all better. But um, now this conversation almost seems silly. Like and if someone came into the wine business, say in 2013 or 14, they would probably find this conversation pretty pedantic. Like, no duh, like, yeah. And we, like, you can make a skin contact Pinot Gris or you could make Alicante Boucher, you could make, you know. It's not even re remarkable. It's almost not even worth discussing now because it just seems like that's just the nature of things. It, it, it would be, I think it would be surprising for some people, younger people, to realize that just 10 years ago, it was a pretty radical notion by local wine standards to abandon the Burgundy mm -hmm. template. Mm -hmm. So timing, I think that I was fortunate to 
have my mentors include Charlie at New Seasons and John, and so I, I was given um, really reliable quality lenses through which to, to view wines. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then um, I think coming up and learning about wine as a retailer rather than in an academic way, like going to Davis, for instance, or going through the court, you know, and having some rigid orthodoxy imposed on me about how one should think about wine. Um, I think my, the way I came into wine was just navigating that world uh, in terms of what was cool and delicious and like affordable and I could get into. And that's just kind of the MO for Bonero. <laughs> that's what we do. I'm, just trying, I mean, I'm not aspiring to do much more than that. I'm not trying to make the most important wine in the world. I think aspiring to make um, wine that's really delicious is, is, is admirable. Mm-hmm. I think that's all, I mean, that if you only do that, you're probably accomplishing a lot in wine. Because it turns out, it's not that easy to make wine that's simply delicious. There's heaps of wine that is, there's more wine that's not delicious. <laughs> there's wine that's delicious. You, therefore, you have to conclude that making delicious wine is harder than it would seem. But there's not a lot of currency in making wine that's simply delicious, you know? We attach a lot of other baggage to it. And I think for the most part, I've avoided putting any baggage on the wine. I think people can relate to it. <clears throat> for a while, I had this metaphor at the risk of getting fucking precious again, that <clears throat> the way I thought about Bone Arrow was <clears throat> like the, be- the Beach Boys. If you don't know anything about music, about arranging, about recording, about songcraft, about musicianship, you can turn on a Beach Boys song and sing along with it and, and have a blast. And it can appear to you as merely bubblegum, trivia, and you can enjoy it without any qualifications. Mm -hmm. But if you do happen to know about that shit and have an appreciation for it or a love for it, the depth of your appreciation and your enjoyment of the Beach Boys is multiplied. And to me, that was the perfect metaphor for Bone Air Wine, that I aspire for people who know nothing at all about wine and maybe don't even care (laughs) to know anything about wine just want to drink something delicious can do that <clears throat> but that that same wine for somebody who does appreciate wine in a more thoughtful or meditative way or academic way or whatever can derive even more pleasure uh, from it mm-hmm. um, and i just felt like that's a i could live if that's all we ever did that i could live with that that's i mean the beach boys are great right <laughs> <laughs> So how do you go about then crafting that kind of wine? That, that kind of sounds like that would be your winemaking philosophy. So how do you go about crafting that kind of wine? Uh, you can see I'm getting uncomfortable because I, I'm not satisfied with my answer. <laughs> um, there's not a formula. If there was a formula, I could just say, oh, this is what we do. Or I'd be like, oh, it's trade secrets. I'm not going to. I'm not going to tell you how I do it. Um, I don't know, honestly. I don't know. Uh, I don't have a formula. I don't use analysis. I don't use a lab. Um, I can calculate some sulfur. If something is going horribly awry, I can send a TTS and. I might be able to make a use of that information that I get back, but probably not because I have no technical training in wine or any background in chemistry or, or science, really. Um, I make wine more or less like you would cook in your kitchen. Chefs don't send their vinaigrette off to the lab to get the pH tested. They fucking taste it. And they're like, oh, it needs more lemon. <laughs> <laughs> To me, wine is food, so I I treat it like food. (laughs) I smell it, I taste it, I look at it. Um, If it's going well, then I chill the F out. If something's going wrong, 
I try to chill that. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes I'll call a friend that's smarter than me or has more training and being like, this is some weird shit. You got any advice? <clears throat> um, so yeah, so that's a long list of, sh of shit I don't do. I think, uh, I'm so uncomfortable saying this. I think when you make wine in this way, when you work with well-farmed fruit that's alive and healthy and you don't try to impose or mitigate that fruit with a bag of tricks, either technological, mechanical tricks or chemical additives, things that change the wine on a molecular or chemical level. Um, I think if you do that, in a sensitive way. <laughs> and by sensitive, I mean just like looking at, listening to what the fruit's telling you. Mm -hmm. It would like to do, like sometimes fruit comes in the door and I think I'm gonna make red wine out of it and it lands here and we taste it. And it's like, that's not red wine. Like I, we'll make rosé out of it. Like you're listening to the fruit. I think if you do that, that yes, it can communicate something about terroir. It can communicate something about <clears throat> the variety. But I think to a large degree, if you make wine in that way with that posture, it says a lot about the person making the human being is as much or maybe more of a lens uh, um, into that wine or vice versa. And that just sounds like a bunch of metaphysical claptrap, but I, I can't. Uh, after doing this since 2005, it just, that's what it feels like to me. And I don't know how this wine comes out the way it does most of the time. I buy fruit from some of the same vineyards as my colleagues and we more or less make it the same way and their stuff comes out tasting totally different than mine. It's picked on the same day. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any explanations for why that happens? You talk to a lot of people. Seriously, do you have any idea how that happens? We hear that question a lot and we never <laughs> have a real good answer for it. Exactly. I don't know. <clears throat> and I think what I'm most pleased with is just being comfortable saying that I don't really know how it comes out that way. Mm -hmm. I like a certain kind of wine. I aspire to make wine that tastes like that. <clears throat> Um, I know a little bit from traveling to those regions and talking to people that I would consider my heroes. <clears throat> I've been trained by some really good, smart, sensitive people. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I have no idea. I, re I really don't. I just, I'm hopeful and aspirational that it turns out, and it usually does. But sometimes it goes really badly and I have to dump shit down the drain. <clears throat> That's a fair trade-off to me um, that's a fair trade-off uh, as opposed to doing everything you have to do to ensure that every wine you make is commercial and can be bottled mm -hmm. and is okay. Mm -hmm. I'd rather fuck it up and pour shit down the drain from time to time in order to have the higher highs or have the wine that is evocative and, or provocative and delicious and alive. I'll probably, yeah, I'll always make that trade-off. So, I don't, I don't, ultimately the answer is I don't know. <laughs> it's a very good way to say I don't know. I appreciate that answer. It's, it's nice. Yeah, I don't know. So you have which sucks because there's my sister and he's trying to figure out how we do what we do, and I just explained to them I don't know. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> At least there's you know there's no bar to clear at that point. You know you just you oh, just shit. whatever happens happens. Yeah, whatever happens. I mean, you know I I think it's. I don't want to make too many musical references, but like, if you get a, like a bunch of like-minded, sensitive musicians in a room who are good at what they do and they know how to listen, like some, some good shit's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. You just, it's more like you create the space for optimal outcomes rather than knowing how to craft the outcome. That's as good explanation as any outcome mm -hmm. up with any. <laughs> I like it. <laughs>
So you have this <coughs> subterranean urban winery space here. Uh, how else do you use it besides, uh, you, you obviously offer it out for, to people. So tell me kind of how that has worked in terms of- Offer it out to people? I'm sorry, like for event, event space. Oh, we don't do that. You don't do event space. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, Let's cut that part entirely out then. Well, we recently, I teased that on the internet. No one's taking us up on it. <laughs> Some other aspiration. Uh, well, you know what's funny is people have inquired, and then I'm like, tell them it'll be this much, and then they're like, no, <laughs> which probably means that on some level I don't actually want to do it. <laughs> that seems reasonable. That seems reasonable. <laughs> so we've never done it. We've we've had parties down here for sure. Sure. We used to do an industry dance party called Skin Contact, where we just invited one or two people and turned off the lights and rented a big sound system and played dance music all night with the hopes of getting everybody to shut up about wine for a minute and just hang out with each other and relate and have a good time. They all just freaking got as far away from the sound system as they could and talked to each other about wine. Mm -hmm. You can't stop it. <laughs> you can only hope to contain it. <laughs> uh, your wife's also in, in the wine business. Uh, tell me a little bit about how that works both, with you guys both being in the wine business together, sort of together. Yeah, it gives us a lot to gossip about. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean it's 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 a real um, asset in life to have a partner that understands what you do and why you do it and how you do it and can give you know feedback and sometimes checks on you mm -hmm. um, because they're qualified to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, have to I don't have to doubt her motives or um, whether she really understands what I'm asking or understands what I'm trying to do. Where if I went to someone I don't know that well, I'd be like, maybe they don't really get what I'm going for here. Mm -hmm. um, that's just, that's, it's just really nice to have someone that you can go home to at the end of the day and be like, level with me. Does this wine suck? <laughs> <laughs> And then they say, yeah, baby, it kind of sucks. Okay, I needed to know that, thanks. <laughs> Whereas if she was in the industry, there's a really good chance that she might just go, oh, you did a good, you did good work. You did a good job. <laughs> no hard, you tried. <laughs> um, you no, know, it's, it's, it's cool. I feel like, you know, like I said, the, the, all the good things that have happened to me in my life have happened because of, of wine and you know I met my wife through wine. Um, wine has given us the ability to have uh, opportunities to do the, the work that we enjoy and that we like and you know I know that that's that's a rare special thing on this earth so um, <clears throat> it's cool to be able to share that with with your person yeah. Mm -hmm. You know she's pretty you know she's a sommelier she probably is less enamored with that term over time. Um, she runs a wine bar. That's probably a, a title that she's more comfortable with. But it's it's cool because we get to see both sides of the coin. Making wine is really isolating, and you're often removed from the end user's experience. You know, there's not there's not a feedback loop. Um, you're just kind of hoping <laughs> that people like your shit as much as you do. <clears throat> so, to order, and, you know, by by having the bar and having her do this work, it gives me, you know, an avenue to touch that and experience that more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and just put our wine in the context of other wines. We don't just sell our wine at the wine bar; we sell the world of wines. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's important if, to make wine that can hang with all the wines. And not just be, oh, that's good for an American wine. <laughs> that's pretty good for Oregon wine. And that's faint praise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you see as you look ahead for Bow and Arrow? Uh, say, ten more years in the future. What are you? What are you hoping for? What are you striving I'm, for? Oh, oh, dude, I don't want to get dark, but I'm hoping we can grow grapes and make wine. That's not the thing I hope for the most. <laughs> but if things are going well, <laughs> things that I do care about the most, then we'll also be able to do that. 
Um, I mean, I have a child. I try not to like dwell on it, but I don't feel optimistic about the way things are going. Um, and by the way things are going, I mean, for life on Earth. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we're just going to screw this all up or not. Um, so I'm not really making plans for bow and arrow 10 years from now. Um, I know if we can't make wine like this, if, it, if we can't make <laughs> relatively cool climate wine, I'm not, I'm not interested. Like I've never bought fruit from Washington or Southern Oregon. Um, I just, um, that, that I'm just not interested. I, I drink wines from warm growing regions. I enjoy them. Mm -hmm. I just don't have any interest in unraveling that mystery of how to make good wine from that kind of climate. I, I'm really only interested in making these kinds of wines in a cool climate growing region. <clears throat> and if we can't do that in 10 years, um, I'll probably be doing something else. Mm -hmm. um, not, I'm not a, a totally attached to this as, as my identity or something. <laughs> I like other things. <laughs> it's been a good run. I like it. But if it, if it ended, and, and you know, certainly if my daughter doesn't want to do this, I'll never ask her or pressure her. I think I, it would be okay with me if this just wraps up and, and I had a good run. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more... Uh, I spend way more time thinking about what we're all going to be doing in 10 years rather than <laughs> what Bone Arrow is going to be doing in 10 years. <laughs> what are we all going to be doing? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think about it much, honestly. I appreciate that because, uh, yeah, I think we kind of all think about that. Yeah. So. <laughs> Whether we admit it or not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you did mention uh, the kind of the new vineyard project you're talking about this with yeah. the grower this weekend and, and hybrids and things like that. Is yeah. anything else you're kind of hoping to dabble in or experiment with? That, no, um, I don't mean, I don't know. If, well, yeah, we can let the cat out and make. I really, you know, I've spent um, an appreciable amount of time talking about this stuff with Mimi Castile. Did you all interview here, or I hope? Not yet, but we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna work on our way that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, she's got some very, very strong um, thoughts on on farming and growing things and the, the, the grape growing industry and viticulture. They're very strident, but I think they're also very correct. Um, the way that we presently do it is not, it's not sustainable. Um, you know, I think the last time I went down to Hopewell and walked the vineyard with her, I think she was spot on in saying vinifera in America is on life support. Like it doesn't make it if you don't have all these inputs, all these things that keep it alive and producing viable fruit. You have to conclude from that is that, that if you if that's what it takes to make it grow, it's probably not meant to grow here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I get it. That's I mean I, that's a very controversial uh, statement. Um, but there are things that are meant to grow here. There are grapes that are native and would happily grow without any of those inputs from the tractor to the sulfur sprays to the, the kind of trellising that we could do to all the mowing and disturbing of the soil by tilling and all of these things that we do just to keep the vinifera producing fruit that we can use. Mm -hmm. It's... Um, it's empirically not good for <laughs> the environment. <laughs> I think that's beyond question now. Even if you're farming organically or biodynamically, you're probably running a tractor through the vineyard way more than a conventional vineyard. So you've got this impacting of the soil and you're burning fossil fuel. There's no, there's no way out of the mess, no matter how conscientiously you're farming vinifera. Like there's no, awesome way to farm vinifera in North America. Um, and so I never really thought about native varieties or hybrids in an appealing way until this dude came and started working for me. Um, and 
concurrent with going to Vermont and meeting with some wine growers there that are strictly farming hybrids. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's nothing that I'm going to do in this cellar with this winery that compares to how exciting that notion is or how important that could be for wine in America because the only goals at this point in the cellar is just to get better at what we already do mm -hmm. and to make a lot more Chenin Blanc. Some people call it Chenin. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, none of that is actually important. That's just an aesthetic. We're just kind of in an aesthetic pursuit at this point, you know, here. Like, how do we just refine this and, and get better? But the hybrid thing, I, th I think changing viticulture is important with the understanding that that's a tiny percentage of agriculture on earth, but you can only influence the, the arenas that you're in, you know? I probably don't have a lot of impact over soybean farming in Indiana, but I got a little bit of influence over what happens in the Willamette Valley because I pay growers money and so I can use that money and have used that money to convince them to stop using Roundup, for instance. You know, I think these are in ways that I can impact this conversation, even if it's on a small scale. Um, and so this vineyard we're looking at this Saturday, I, I hope to pitch to them this idea of planting at least part of it into hybrids and seeing how, if it's possible for us to put these grapes in a premier growing region and make them in a cellar that I, I think has demonstrated that it can make quality and commercially viable wine, mm -hmm. which there's not really a, a lot of test cases for that. <clears throat> and then see how little we can do in the vineyard and achieve that. Like how, in theory, you shouldn't have to spray anything. You shouldn't, which means maybe you never have to put a, a tractor in there. Um, and so um, I did not intend to go down this road, but that's probably the most exciting or interesting or compelling thing I can think of that we'll be pursuing in, in the future. Sure. Yeah. Cool. That's really interesting and exciting. Looking forward to seeing how it turns out. I hope it makes good wine. Because <laughs> otherwise, because if it doesn't, it just, it won't matter. You're not going to convince anybody. If you can't make good wine out of it, it's kind of dead in the water, but sure. I'm hopeful. Sure. Yeah. So you talked about the changes you've seen, uh, especially with uh, varietals and, and willingness to diversify since you started in the industry. Uh -huh. At the risk of, again, asking about the future, what do you see, <laughs> what do you see Oregon wine looking like as you look down the road in the industry? What, what, what changes are coming? What, uh, what's the, the future of the industry look like? I don't think, I, I think the, the, the horses have left the barn. I don't think we're going to go back to, uh, we'll ever go back to just being Little Burgundy. Um, I suppose it's possible, but if you travel around this country, and in fact travel to other major cities in the world, <clears throat> and you go to the coolest restaurants and go to the, like, the really good shops and look around, what you find representative of Oregon is a lot of not Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and Pinot Gris. The, that will always exist. It's not, that is, I'm not implying that that will go away. And I'm not implying that that will ever not be the dominant paradigm. But there's just too much representation of this kind of new school mm -hmm. approach to viewing Oregon or the Willamette Valley that I can't ever see it going back. <clears throat> And not just because the market seemingly is asking for it or demanding it, but concurrent with this shift was what I view as a democratization of wine. The obstacle to entry has lowered tremendously from 10 years ago um, because you no longer have to be able to buy land and build a winery to get into it. It's commonplace now for a SOM or somebody that works in the industry or someone who doesn't to get a hold of a, a place like the Southeast Wine Collective or any number of places and say, hey, I want to make a few barrels of wine. And they can find fruit and they can find fruit with low stakes because they can find something that no one's really demanding or working with and it's affordable. It's not 
three, four thousand dollars a ton, and they can try it out and make a go of it. It's messy, as we have come to learn that democracy can be. <laughs> You're gonna take, like a lot more shitty wine is gonna be made in this process, but also at the same time, we're gonna taste wines and see people making wine that would have never had an opportunity to prior to, you know, probably like, yeah, about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think that's positive and I can't see that being undone. But I also didn't see liberal democracy being undone in America in my lifetime. So I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know sometimes. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think it's I think it's here to stay because there's just too many forces at work that want that want to see this, mm -hmm. um, and there may be people who don't. I'm quite sure actually there's some people that don't want to see it, but shit, it's life, <laughs> it's happening, <laughs> it's happening, and I think it's good, I think it's good, I think some of the very finest American wine that I've tasted in the last few years has come from untraditional varieties mm -hmm. from their respective regions in the hands of young new winemakers. Yeah, more like lots of delicious shit. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Okay, that's all the questions that I have okay. for you today. Uh, we answered all of them and more today, so as you as you can guess. Uh, so uh, I'm very subtextual. On, on, on that said, uh, do you have anything else to add? Anything I should have asked that I didn't? Anything we didn't cover that we should have covered today? <laughs> You've done this so many times. If it was interesting, you probably would have asked about it. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't have anything that I feel um, beyond what we already talked about that I, need to, that I need to share. I thought that was a pretty good conversation. It was a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Those are good questions. Thank, thank you. And thank you so much for your time today yeah. and for your answers and thoughts. And uh, we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. All right.